to another episode of Ghost History Medium. This is the investigation reveal for location number eight, where we went to Split Rock Reservoir in Rockaway Township, New Jersey. This spot has a ton of history that goes back to the American Revolution and very early settlers, and there's ruins here that you can visit. There's also recreation opportunities, which have been possible since the 1950s, and there's Native American history, too. So let's go into it. We're going to talk about some of the individuals and some of the history we found on our walkthrough. So as a run through, we're going to first start off about the land history, including Beaver Lake, the Split Rock and the furnaces that are there. Then we're going to go into the three 1970s murders, which were unfortunately, um, according to the newspapers, were true. And also talk about the man who drowned. So let's start with some of the land history. All right, so like usual, I like to give us an overview of where we were doing our investigation in comparison to the location. So the image on the left is a Google map image of Split Rock Reservoir. As you can see, it's really long and skinny. And the yellow star down on the southwest portion is where we sat to do our reading. The right image, again, is still a Google image, and it's more zoomed up of where we were sitting, which is right by that boat launch in the gold star. And you can see how close we were to the furnaces on the left. What I also really like about this image, too, is it labels Beaver Brook. You can see that blue line that's coming right next to the furnaces going down, and that's Beaver Brook. Now, Beaver Brook um, connects Split Rock Reservoir to the Rockaway River, and the Rockaway River feeds into the Booten Reservoir. So the Split Rock Reservoir and the Booten Reservoir are linked together, and they are actually owned by the same um, Jersey City Water Company at this point in time. So a few things that I picked up on my historical reading of the place when I remotely viewed the location back into history, I always saw that there was a body of water there. I did see a stream coming in and a stream coming out, but I always saw that there was a body of water. Now it is currently dammed up, but I always saw that there was a larger body of water, not just a stream coming through. I also saw that there was a Native American um, pathway through there and also that they use that for resources. And I did also see that the land was significantly logged at some point in time, so no trees were anywhere near it. So what was interesting is that I could actually find that information confirmed back into the history books. So local tradition has it that Split Rock waters originated as a beaver pond, which would make sense because the waterway that comes out of the dam is called Beaver Brook. And it's been called Beaver Brook back into the earliest surveys of the area. So it very is likely that there was um, some degree of a pond there for a long time. And the reason why the furnaces were located here on this pond was because of that resource, that it was a pond and it had a river coming out of it. And the name Split Rock is supposed to have originated from a um, rock formation of where the water went down and washed away in the middle a groove into um, a patch of rocks. So that's where the Split Rock comes from. Uh, at this point in time, that formation is now under the water, under the reservoir. I did find a few references about Native Americans in this area. So from Bulletin 9, which is an archaeological survey from 1913 by Max Schrabisch, who is well known for documenting various Native American archaeological sites in the state of New Jersey, he does note that specifically in Rockaway Township, there was a campsite and fishing place that was located on the southern end of Split Rock Pond. And actually that would line up very closely to where we were sitting and doing our reading, um, which would be at the southern end. I don't know which side, but it was on the southern end. And also it seems that they did find some Indian bivouacs, not quite sure what those are, found around the shores in the early Split Rock Pond indicate a sizable body of water even before the appearance of man-made dams over 200 years ago. And they likely, uh, concluded that summer fishing sites were located in that area. So continuing the land history, when I was viewing the land, the name Ogden came up, and specifically Ogden and land. I said he must have owned land around here. And I was able to find that in 1765, David and then son Samuel Ogden, who lived in Booton, ended up owning 3,656 acres of land, and this tract was known as the Great Booton Tract. And it includes what is now mostly Booton Township, some of Canelon, and some of Denville, up to Taylortown. And I also was able to find a reference 
of possibly a slitting mill at Split Rock, which was owned by David Ogden back in, 19, in excuse me, in 1770. And it was the first one to be known to be built in the province. Now, I did find other references that actually put the slitting mill at um, in Bootin, down by the, the Rockaway River in Bootin. So I'm not quite sure how accurate that information is, but at least one reference did put Ogden in this area by the split rock. Now, the other interesting thing that kind of connects Ogden to this area was Lamel Cobb. And it seems that David Ogden was either friends or acquaintances with Lemuel Cobb. And Cobb bought 3,000 acres of land around Split Rock Pond, um, also known as Beaver Pond, Beaver Lake, or Split Rock Lake. And this is a reference here on the right from Historical Discourse of Booton from 1867 that's talking about um, David Ogden and um, Cobb actually having references of buying land, recommending to buy land from this person or that person. So they were kind of in the same area, both buying land. And I was able to find the original surveying uh, markers of the Bootin, the Great Bootin Tract, but because I don't really have surveying skills, I couldn't put those um, degrees and those markers onto a map of today to know exactly where the margins are. And it doesn't seem like anybody else has been able to do that as well. So it is possible that David Ogden did own land all the way up to Split Rock, but I wasn't able to find anything that confirmed that. Now, the furnace um, was first built before 1803, and this is the furnace that is standing there today. It was built by Ebenezer Ferrand. It was replaced in 1837 by Cobb, and then another one was built in 1862. And this second furnace was the last furnace to be built in New Jersey, actually. And these furnaces were used to burn um, uh, pig iron and make pig iron. Now, what's so important about having furnaces in the area is because they needed charcoal. And another great way and reason why they used this area was because it was heavily forested at the time. But they needed all of that forest and cut down all the trees to make charcoal. So. I definitely can imagine that whole entire area around those furnaces was cut down for charcoal to, to run the furnaces. Now, once the um, Morris Canal was built in 1830s, cheaper coal was brought in from Pennsylvania. So probably around the 1830s, there was less logging in the area and maybe more farming, but um, definitely it's very likely that this whole area around the Split Rock was logged intensively for charcoal. These furnaces were then abandoned in 1870s. I did want to show this map. This is a recent Google map of the area. Rockaway Township is on the left, Booton Township's on the bottom, and Kinelon is on the top right. So Ogden owned land in Booton Township for sure, and maybe some into Kinelon and also into Denville. And Cobb owned land in Kinelon and um, some of Rockaway and all around Split Rock Reservoir. So you know, it's possible that Ogden did at some point own land up into Split Rock Reservoir and then sold it to Cobb. It's possible. I couldn't find anything to confirm this. But that being said, um, Ogden was a very well-known man in the area, and he did own a very large tract of land. He's also known for making one of the first roads in the area, specifically for moving iron ore from the Hibernia mines into Booton called McCaffrey Lane. These are some really fun historical photos I found from 1939 of what the furnaces looked like at that time. This was um, done for a historical application to make this a historical landmark. And as you can see, even on the bottom right, there's still some woodwork and labeling that was present at that time. I don't, I don't think those are there now, but I loved how you could still see it at that point in time. And this map on the bottom was made and you can clearly see the dam on the right, which um, this dam would have been before the new dam that was built in 1948, but we'll get to that. You can see the waterway coming down, the gray square in the middle bottom with a little circle in it, that's the main furnace. And then on the left, on the bottom, is the second furnace. I also love here that it's called Beaver Brook, and above it is just called Extensive Forest. So I thought that was really fun um, as an image of how it looked at that point in time.
The other thing I love about this is that it's so close to the road, you can just go ahead and park where we parked by the boat launch and walk down right below the dam and you can go to this furnace and see it for yourself. You can go and walk around a piece of the American Revolution history and I don't know, maybe you'll hear some old banging or feel its warmth. Okay, so after 1870s when the furnaces were not working in the area any longer, in 1889, Son Andrew Cobb leased 500 acres to Montclair Water Company, and they so that's when this area first started getting used as a reservoir. Then in 1896, Montclair Water Company purchased the land, and then in 1922, the land was conveyed to Montclair Service Company of New York City, and again in the same year, the land was then conveyed to Mayor and Alderman of Jersey City. The dam that is currently there was built in 1948. And at that point in time, the water was then raised 20 feet to present day levels. Today, it is still owned by the Jersey City Municipal Utilities Authority, just like Booton Reservoir is. These are some historical photos of the dam being built back in 1948. And this is a huge rock here in the middle that sometimes when there's a big drought in the reservoir, you can see the rock. But on a normal day in normal times, you can just see the very, very, very tip of the top um, and not the entire iceberg that's underneath. So the reservoir was designated in November 10th, 1948, and it was used as a back, well, it still is, used as a backup reservoir to Booton Reservoir. And again, here's the dedication of a Split Rock Reservoir. So I thought this was really neat. And um, we're going to continue to talk about November and December timelines. So this is just another date that's important to this reservoir. This is a fun map I, I tried to create for you. So I wanted to know what um, the pond looked like back then as far as land mass. So again, the gold stars are where we were doing our reading. The map on the left is from 1887 and the map on the right is from 2020. And you can see there's two bodies of water on the left, Split Rock Pond and Durham Pond. And I was able to find Durham Pond on the current map and I labeled it here at the top for you. So. Knowing where those two landmarks are, you can see now that this whole entire area that's circled in here is new water after the dam was placed and it was flooded 20 feet. Now on the map on the right, the recent map, I circled where the original reservoir is and the map on the left, I circled where the reservoir is now. All right, so that wraps some of the history of the land. Let's go into the three murders in 1970. One thing of note, you know, when I was at the location and describing these individuals that had been murdered, I saw them as women, and I'm not quite sure why that happened. You know, mediumship is not a perfect science by any measure of the imagination, which is why I'm really big on going back and finding evidence. So that being said, a lot of the other information I said was very accurate, but I really can't explain why I saw them as women. They were all men. This is the first article I came across that confirmed that, yes, there were definitely murders that happened in the reservoir. This is an article from 1983 that's talking about a gentleman that died cliff jumping, and it, in it, it refers to two different murders, one that was in 1974 and one that was in 1976 but it also specifically talks about why that time frame there was also another murder in 1977 but why that time frame was so dangerous in this area and it turns out this area used to be patrolled a lot by Jersey City Rangers and stuff was happening in the early 70s and it seemed like there was a lot of activity in the area and one of the rangers quit and once that ranger quit it was just chaos and a lot of stuff was going on it was even so bad and dangerous in the area that a lot of residents were protesting and saying that they needed more patrols. So after that, around um, 1978, there began a lot more patrolling of the area and there haven't really been any issues, major issues such as murder since. So I can only find three murders that happened in the 70s. I couldn't find any other information about other murders that had happened in the area. So that was pretty remarkable. So this is the first murder that happened March 3rd, 1974. It was a 19-year-old male named David Phillips, and he was stabbed six times in the body. Now, his assailant was convicted, and it had to have been done. Um, it was something over drugs with a boyfriend and jealousy and, and things like that. He was found the day after. 
And he was found, and it's described that he was hacked to death. So that definitely goes along with an individual that is either just out of, just in college or just out of college around that time frame um, with severe injuries to the body, stabbing wounds to the body. This is an article from the second murder, and this article is from November 4th, 1976. And it talks about these three individuals who murdered a man named Charles P. Oms, who was 37 years old. He was killed November 1st and found November 2nd. Remember, November is really important. That was the time frame that the uh, dam was built. And it's described he was stabbed 27 times and his throat was slit. It thought that this was done over money. These three individuals thought he had had $1,000 on him, so kind of kidnapped him, brought him to the reservoir and asked him for his money, and that didn't go well. All three of these individuals were convicted. So this is a newspaper article of the third murder. This article is from December 4th, 1977. It describes a 47-year-old white male named Robert Berger who was shot twice in the chest, once in the temple. Now, what's really disturbing about this murder was that he was actually reported missing in September, but he wasn't found by, until December 2nd, and that was by a ranger. And how the ranger found his body was it was buried underneath sticks and rocks and leaves. Talking about the head pain I was getting during my conversation with these individuals, and I have a feeling that this was the pain that I was feeling was from Robert Berger. Um, this man lived kind of a double life. Um, they're not quite sure what happened or what the disagreement was over, but the assailants of his murder were also convicted. So those are the only three murders that I could find in all of Split Rock's history. Um, and they all happened in this very short time frame. Had to do with March, November, December. And what was really interesting is that we actually did our walk through December 9th. And I had been feeling this uh, pull to come to this area to do a reading for weeks beforehand. Um, I would say starting in November, but I would say the first week in December, it was like really intense that we had to schedule and to do this. And I, and I do think it was time for them to bring their story forward, um, especially around Christmas carols and family and, you know, that they are still there and they should still be remembered for these tragic murders that happened in the area. But that being said, now the area is very well patrolled. There are a lot of police officers there and I haven't heard of any significant issues or serious offenses. I will finish up talking about the man who drowned. So unfortunately, just like I guess any large body of water, um, there have been a lot of drownings at Split Rock Reservoir, and I had to kind of go through each one of the ones I could at least find in the newspapers and history books to see if any of them really matched the individual who came forward to me. So this is describing three fairly recent drownings that were pretty major that happened at the reservoir. The one on the upper left is from 1978, and it was a man who was out night fishing with his friend, and something had happened to the boat, and it flipped over. But it was at night, and it wasn't, uh, there weren't other people on the, on the water, and he was with a friend. The one on the bottom is from 1963, and this is super tragic. Um, mother and father drowned trying to save their 12-year-old son who was drowning. So three family members in one day drowned in the reservoir. This was a really difficult situation that the town and the community and the family went through. The individual on the right is a 37-year-old um, warden who, it's kind of mysterious what happened to him, but it has something to do with a gunshot and drowning, but he was out working and something happened while his boat was uh, leaving the island in the middle and he died. So this was in 1951. You know, again, I don't think this was the individual that I saw because um, the age doesn't fit and the general time frame that this uh, gentleman came to me doesn't fit the 50s. This was a more recent individual and he had um, what I could see was a more recent kayak. An even more recent tragic incident that I could find in the newspaper articles 
was a Totowa man who drowned um, on Memorial Day weekend in 2018. What happened was his kayak was found overturned by an eyewitness May 28th, and it seems they recovered his body about four days later. He was 55 years old. He was from Totowa. He was known to be an avid outdoorsman with kayaking and an avid fisherman as well. He did not have any children of his own, but he did have nephews, younger nephews. He was also, his occupation was making fragrances. And, you know, I mentioned he was making something, but he worked in an office building. This picture on the bottom right here is um, the office that he worked at, and he made fragrances for Maine, USA. You know, he kept talking to me about this this life vest, this fishing life vest that he had on. It was like one in both. And little known to me, I didn't know that this was actually a thing, but they're called PFDs where they can hold your tackle and also act as a life jacket and are commonly used by avid fishermen. You know, I also mentioned Apple, and Apple for me can be New York City, can also be teacher or school. And I, I think I was interpreting it as teacher or school, but it could have also have been a reference to his former occupation of being a New York fashion photographer. I don't know if he lived in New York at the time, um, but it does say that he worked in New York. Now, I want to say that all of this information I did get from his public obituary. I did not get any of these pictures or information from Facebook. The picture on the right is him of his dogs. He um, loved his dogs. I also found some pictures of him where he did have darker hair and he did have a small mustache and small stubble beard. So a lot of this makes sense with this individual um, coming up to me and talking about what happened to him. And, you know, he does bring up a good point about there being better signs or more awareness, you know, that incidents can happen, go with friends, go with people, you know, um, wear your safety gear. And I think that's a really important message that he did want to get across and that he loves his family. So that wraps up our reading and reveal of Split Rock Reservoir. It is absolutely a beautiful place with tons of history and it's beautiful to hike around and to kayak, but please, please, please be careful, know where you are. Um, know your surroundings, and definitely no cliff jumping, and keep your life vests on. Um, stay tuned for our next location. Thanks so much.